To camouflage oneself is to use any material that helps in the process of blending into the surrounding environment. In this documentary, military experts demonstrate step by step how to make a variety of camouflage systems, the ghillie, the yeti, and the bush rag. This video covers the materials needed and how to manipulate these materials to create combat effective camouflage. This video also covers stalking and movement tactics, face painting, and how to conceal equipment. In the wilds, it is survival of the fittest, and often the game is won by any animal who can remain unseen. In this process, animals have evolved with pigmentation patterns, which help to break up the general outline or shape of their bodies. Giraffes, cheetahs, and zebras are among the many animals who have evolved with these patterns of camouflage. Another important element of concealment is movement. What doesn't move usually will not be seen. The old axiom stands. The eye is drawn to movement. If an animal must move, say a lion, to take a better stalking position, then a steady and slow movement is usually employed. Other animals have been given genetic advantages like the baby Thompson gazelle, which is born without a scent and which will instinctively hide when its mother is away. Baby cheetahs are born with extra long fur on the top of their backs so that they may blend into grass better when hiding. And there seems to be a host of other specialty acts which animals employ to remain hidden. The African dung beetle, however, is just trying to take dinner back home. Of course, four-legged animals are not the only ones who have learned to hide themselves. Man, too, has learned the art of concealment, blending and moving with skill. Early Pleistocene hunters could move closer to their prey. So now grab a paper and pen as military experts demonstrate to you the art the of concealment. Of suit. First thing uh, we're going to need obviously is some type of clothing to attach our camouflage material to and we'd like to recommend a uh, flight suit. However, if you don't have access to a flight suit, you can use an old army uniform such as BDUs or old jungle fatigue. But here before you see in various stages of preparation, we have four uh, different ghillie suits. The flight suit's kind of unique in the fact that it's a one-piece item. You don't have to worry about getting branches, things like that, down into your uh, groin area or up underneath your shirt, and that's why we like to go with that. And also, it fits a little more comfortable and a little more snugly than a two-piece clothing would. <clears throat> As you can see here, what we've started with the materials need paint, dye for your burlap, also quilting needles, they can be straight or curved as you see here, need unwaxed dental floss, again the reason we use unwaxed dental floss is because it's a very strong tensile strength thread and it doesn't rot. <coughs> you don't want to use waxed dental floss because it won't hold a knot because it's such a slick uh, line that the knots won't stay in it, so use unwaxed dental floss. Another important material is shoe goo. Okay, you can use this for actually attaching netting or the patches like you see on some of our other uh, ghillie suits as we go along. Another expedient you can use instead of dental floss is nylon fishing line. Again, the reason for this is because of the high tensile strength and it will not rot. And the last thing we'll be needing here in the line of uh, man-made materials is an X-Acto blade or a uh, pair of scissors. Now we talked about the man-made store items. By the way, all of these items you can get from any type of hardware, uh, grocery store, or fabrics and craft center. And relatively inexpensively, I'd say this whole pile of stuff here probably wasn't over 20 or $30 altogether. And the flight suits themselves, uh, depending on where you go, whether it's a surplus or a military clothing and sales store, probably run you in the neighborhood of 30 to $40. Okay, moving over here to the uh, actual suits themselves. <coughs> We started and we're in various stages right here and we'll talk you along as we go. The material that we're going to be tying on to the ghillie suit itself you can get from a variety of sources. This is store-bought 
uh, what they call moulage, okay, or material camouflage. And all it is is burlap cut into one inch wide strips, rolled up in a nice convenient roll like this, and dyed various colors. However, if you don't have access to this stuff from a power military store, you can just take a regular burlap bag like they use for uh, coffee bags, uh, sandbags, whatever. And you can see here what we've done is taken some of the dyes that we've had and we've dyed them various earthy tone colors. You want to stay away from real bright or unnatural colors. You want to stick with your earthy tones. Don't get into the hot pinks or uh, flamingos or anything like that or pastels. You want earthy tone colors because that's what you find out here in nature. One of the other important things that you're going to need is some canvas. As you can see, as we started on this suit here, we shoe gooed a piece of canvas from an old sea bag or duffel bag onto the front around the knee area because you're going to spend the majority of your time with a ghillie suit crawling across, uh, along the ground. So you need to reinforce the knees, the chest, and the elbow areas. So you can see we started this one and over here on this suit that's nearly complete we have the canvas on all the portions of the suit that need reinforcement. Now the uh, suit itself as far as the canvas goes you can attach it by sewing or shoe gluing. That one's attached with shoe goo this one's attached with uh, sewing or uh, sewing machine rather and you have to use an industrial grade sewing machine like they use for uh, rigging of parachutes or sail making because it is very thick fabric and you don't want to break your wife's sewing machine or your friend's sewing machine okay and one of the other things that you're going to do that the reason we have spray paint is once you have your canvas all done what you're going to do is spray paint the front just to break up the color a little bit doesn't have to be anything fanciful. Again, you can see there's no uh, science to it. You're just breaking it up a little bit with a little splotchy pattern. Next area you want to talk about is actual headgear that the uh, sniper or cameraman is going to be using while wearing the ghillie suit. There's a variety of different ways you can attach headgear or have a separate piece. First one we'll talk about is an actual separate hat. And what I've done, I've taken a hat, as you can see from the inside here, and I took some netting, again some of the moulage material, just plain uh, green netting. And if you don't have access to this, you can use the military camouflage net. All you have to do is cut off the rubber camouflage, ensure that you remove these little rings that are on here, okay, that attaches the camouflage to the netting, because again, you don't want metal to give your position away. All right, and you can sew that directly onto your hat. Now, this one I had a different type of netting, but it really doesn't matter which type of netting you use. You could even go to a civilian uh, fishing supply store and get some of their netting. But again, you want it in the colors, earthy colors, greens, blacks, browns. Once we've sewn it on and I attach this one with dental floss, <coughs> you're going to go ahead and start putting your burlap strips on. All you have to do is make a small hole in the net and tie your burlap material on in an overhand knot. Nothing fancy. Once you have the burlap on, and you want to make sure you cover as much as you can. You don't want any of the brim or the bill of the hat exposed for the reason you're trying to, that's the whole purpose behind a ghillie suit is you're trying to break up the human outline. You want no sharp angles because there aren't really any in nature. So you want a moundy appearance. Once you have all your burlap attached, then you're going to go ahead and start fraying it. Just like that. That way, when this stuff starts to lay on there, <coughs> you don't get the nice square rectangular pieces like you have that's apparent right now. We still have to fray the, the rest of this for it to look proper, but you get the idea. Another technique you can use that we're going to be doing on another ghillie suit is putting a hood. And what you're going to do with the hood <coughs> is take the collar of your flight suit or the shirt that you're using for your ghillie suit, and you're going to sew directly along the collar a hood from a jacket or you could even sew net that's attached to a hat on here and this is kind of nice because it's a one piece deal you don't have to worry about leaving your hat behind it's already attached to the suit but all you're going to do is sew it on reinforce the stitching with shoe goo and then <coughs> you've 
you've got your hood on, and again, you camouflage that the same way that you have the rest of your suit. If we look around here, what we've been doing so far, you can see suits in various stages of preparation. We'll start with this one, because this one's the least finished so far. We've got our flight suit. We checked to make sure we had no large rips or tear that needed to be repaired prior to us starting. Then what we did, we laid the suit out on its front, extended the arms and the back section out. We then took some net from an old army camouflage net and we laid it out along the back and cut it out. The next thing we did is we took shoe goo, which we discussed about earlier, and we went all along the perimeter along where these knots are and glued it onto the fabric itself. What I'm doing is removing the uh, the radar reflecting clips off of this camouflage net because they're silver, as uh, I've said earlier. Give your position away. If the sun hits you just right. <clears throat> Once we were done with that, we picked up the net and found out where the saggy portions were, and shoe glued it uh, to reinforce it so it wouldn't bulge out as much. Because if you just glue the perimeter on and you don't glue anything or sew anything in the center you get a very saggy appearance and your camouflage will all droop around your waist or it could possibly just tear right off the back of your suit so you want to reinforce it along the middle and you don't want more than about an inch to two inches of give in any one section of the net so you go ahead and glue it and check your different sections around to make sure you don't have too much give or play in any of the netting material the knots in them so you tie it tight and then what I do is once I have all my knots tied onto my netting, I then take, I I take the shoe goo and I apply a little dab to the knot. Once you're done with that, then you concentrate on the front side. <clears throat> and you can see right now, we've already done one knee patch on this flight suit. And over here, <clears throat> you can see another fellow. At this time, he's going ahead and, and shoe gooing his knee patch on. Again, all he did was put a, an S or an X shaped pattern of glue on the reverse side of the fabric and then once he gets done he presses that down firmly on the fabric. Wants to hold it for a couple minutes. Shoe goo sets relatively fast. It's got the same consistency of rubber cement. Fairly easy to work with. Okay, one of the other things we'd like to point out is here you see on this flight suit we have canvas. What Ron's using here is a rubberized fabric, okay? Uh, the big thing with any of the fabrics that you're going to use for reinforcement, one, it has to be a very robust or durable type fabric. It has to be very thick and sturdy. And the other thing, you want to have some type of uh, earthy color again. Again, your olive drab greens, browns, uh, anything that wouldn't really stand out in nature. And the other thing, like you can see here, it's got a little bit of a glossy appearance to it, but it'll still work because we're going to spray paint over it. And the nice thing about this fabric that he's using is that it's waterproof. So it'll probably have a little bit of longer uh, lifespan than our canvas would. So again, it's a matter of personal preference or the materials that you actually have available at hand. Don't get too wrapped around the axle saying, well, I have to have this. You're going to use what you have available in your local area. And the big thing, just remember, basic rules, it has to be thick, durable cloth, and it has to be earthy tuned with uh, colored materials. You want to be careful so you don't cut the flight suit itself. So keep lifting the canvas up away from the flight suit as you cut. Okay, as you can see now, we have a nice piece of canvas that goes from seam to seam. And all we're going to do is simply shoe glue this. Now, the important thing, you might have to fine tune it a little bit, but as I mentioned earlier before, 
better to cut it too large than too small, okay? So we're just gonna fine tune here a little bit, totally flatten the fabric out, make sure that we're from seam to seam. Okay, now that I've got that done, I'm gonna go ahead and flip my fabric over, make sure it's nice and clean, and the material I'm gonna be adhering it to is also relatively clean and dry, but won't have too much of an impact here, it's just a little bit damp. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and take our shoe goo, and basically we're just gonna make a big S pattern along here, and then firmly press it down on here, and then we're gonna go along the edges so the material doesn't fray too much on you, and it plus it gives it a double gluing, so it makes it stay on a little better. And just like toothpaste, you wanna start at the base of the tube and work your way towards the top. You can see how thick the shoe goo is here. It's very much like rubber cement, but even thicker. And if you have to help it out with your finger a little bit, no problem. Once he's done with that, he's going to reinforce along the edges like we have right here with more shoe goo. Again, the spray paint that we used on the other suit is going to cover up a lot of that glossy or shiny appearance. These are my knee, my knee pads um, from uh, my waist down just to with the zipper that will go above my boots and then uh, my chest pads my chest patches and I've cut them rounded corners because these will be on the ground quite a bit and I don't, even though it's going to be uh, uh, glued down to the to the flight suit, I don't want there to be any corners that could catch and tear the patch off. So all my patches from the waist up are rounded like my elbow patches up there. When applying your pads, it's important to remember that when you put on your elbow pads on your ghillie suit, it's not like wearing a sports jacket. You're going to be using your elbows to crawl along and to rest on. So you have the proper position of your elbow pads, if you look, it's not like it would be on a, on, on a normal jacket. It's almost underneath the, the bend of the elbow, which still provides me the material to crawl along with and to protect my elbow. Or the chest patches in, or, or provide room for me to bend at the waist here without too much difficulty and uh, for the zipper that goes up and down. As you can see, the pockets are going to be useless, so they're just emptied and zipped and um, flattened out so that when the patches are applied, they're, they're no problem. There's no need to cut out the zippers or anything like that. Another thing to keep in mind is when you're using the, uh, the glue or the shoe goo or any of the other products to apply the, the patches to your, to your ghillie suit, just make sure you have a well ventilated area. You can see here we have all the open windows. And uh, once your suit is drying, put it in a well ventilated area. Uh, at this point, you can go ahead and just lay it on outside. It should be fine. Try and keep it out of the rain and uh, let, the, let the shoe goo dry or the glue dry before uh, you continue on from one step to another. Another important thing that we found out, uh, much to our chagrin there, was the uh, tackiness of the glue. It sticks on your fingers and it's kind of like having a real thick coat of rubber cement. You kind of have to roll it or scrape it off your fingers. Uh, a nice technique you can use is to have a set of surgical gloves or you can use a tongue depressor or popsicle stick uh, to help you put the stuff on. Once we're done with that, then we're going to move on to the actual camouflage uh, itself. And you can see over here, <coughs> Romero here is cutting up some more burlap fabric into strips. And again, these strips are approximately one inch wide, and you go between eight to 10 inches long. And all you're gonna do is attach it onto the net in the back with an overhand knot. Simply take one end, you wanna twist it around so it's a little easier to work with. Put it around the net, take the running end, pass it back through the loop, and then cinch it down. Make sure you pull on both ends so it's in there pretty firm. Once you got it, jerk on a little bit to make sure that it's in place. Then you'll go to the end of it and you'll start to fray it. All you have to do is pull the long end of the fabric strands individually. And you can see how it's starting to fray nicely for us here. Until we totally get the fabric frayed. And again, this isn't a quick project it takes you several hours, if not days, to construct a proper ghillie suit. 
what I do now is show you on the back of a suit here how we're going to tie this stuff off. I've been showing you earlier utilizing the finger, but what you're going to do is start from the bottom and work your way up the top. The reason for that, as these knots progress up towards the top, it's going to occlude the rest of your work, so you don't want to start at the top or you're constantly going to be flipping this material back up to try and get your knots in. So you start down here at the bottom. And again, there's no set. You don't have to have three greens followed by two browns, followed by one dark green. It doesn't matter. It's a random pattern. <clears throat> you just don't want 15 of one color on one little square here, okay? Just kind of mix them up as you go. So we're going to go ahead and twist the ends up here a little bit. Once we got it through, we're going to pass it underneath the net. Again, pass the running end back through the boot loop or bite that we formed. Cinch it down. Pull on both ends. Make sure you have a nice snug knot. Once you've done that, you can go ahead and fray it a little bit. Uh, one of the drawbacks to using these burlap strips when you're tying it to your ghillie suit is that when you start to fray it, as you were shown, you're going to lose these cross sections. So when you use the burlap strip material, you're going to lose about half your burlap. So uh, another thing that you can do instead of using burlap strips is actually taking the strings right out of the burlap bag. So what you're first going to want to do is take your bag and cut out the seam. So you take your scissors and you'll work your way all along the bag until you got your seam out. And then you'll take your burlap material. And you can see I've already started destringing this side. So what I'm going to do is lay this material down. I'm going to anchor it with my feet. And then I'm going to find a, a, a middle spot, the middle position of the bag. You're just going to start pulling these strings out. And once you get going, you can pull about two strings at a time. I know it seems tedious, but uh, you do save time and that you're not having any waste. So once I grab, say, 10 to 20 strands, I'll cut them into their 8 inch length. And then over here, you can see I have my ghillie suit. And I've started from the bottom. I've worked my way up. And the last place that I have is here at the top of the suit, right uh, on the upper back portion. So I'm going to take the bald spot. I'm going to find the netting, and I'm going to pass through the burlap lines, the burlap strings underneath, and then I'm going to do my little half hitch or overhand knot and sit you down on it. Um, also, you're going to want to attach this burlap material onto uh, the sleeve portion of your ghillie suit. So you're going, to, you're going to sew down your netting, and then you're going to tie your burlap into it. So you have this area camouflaged as well. And of course, you're still going to have your patch. You don't want to cover your patch, the underneath area, with uh, the burlap flat material. You want to put your canvas patch there on the bottom. Right now we have a rain delay, so we're going to move indoors because the rain is uh, getting onto the shoe goo and it's uh, keeping it from uh, doing its job. You can see now we're just about nearing completion on the uh, headgear portion of the ghillie suit. And if I come underneath here, kind of fluff this out a little bit like it'll be worn. And it's very difficult to tell, for one, there's a hat underneath there, and you can imagine a human head uh, totally breaks up the outline. It has that real nice shaggy or moundy appearance, and very difficult to uh, detect. And you can see again, with my color patterning that I've done, is primarily for the Northwest area of the United States, and the fact that I have a lot of greens, just a little hint of brown, because of the uh, dense uh, fern and uh, Douglas firs, things like that. They have a lot of dark greens out here, so that's why I've gone with uh, this particular type of pattern. And one important thing, once you get done, as I'm holding this thing up, I kind of want to spread it out a little bit and see how much exposed netting that I have so I can see little trouble areas that I need to add some additional burlap to, like down in this area right here and maybe over in this far corner because I don't want, uh, although the netting is green, 
it's not the same pattern as everything else, so I'm probably going to want to add a little bit of uh, burlap to those areas right there. Always inspect your work. Don't think it's a done thing. It's a constantly uh, changing piece of artwork, so to speak. And the fact that burlap will fall off and you'll constantly need to add new pieces or if you're going to a different part of the country to operate or even another uh, foreign country for that matter, you might need to uh, change your burlap pattern on there to match. One of the things you have to remember about uh, your ghillie suit, especially if you're going to use it for hunting or uh, photographing wildlife, is that a lot of animals obviously have better uh, sense of smell than we do. So when you're, once your ghillie suit is finished, you obviously just can't throw this into the washing machine. Um, chances are you'll probably never wash your ghillie suit again. So uh, the best thing to, to do is when you have it and it's wet or from using it, then just hang it outside. Don't hang it inside the house. Don't hang it inside the garage. Don't put it into the dryer because you'll be buying a new dryer. Um, and uh, if, when you first get your uh, flight suit, if uh, it's been washed, go down to uh, your local uh, outdoor store and buy some uh, natural biodegradable soap and rewash it because a lot of the today's detergents that you buy at the supermarkets um, leave uh, residue in the fabric that uh, certain animals like elk can see and it will just make you stick out. So wash your flight suit in a uh, natural biodegradable soap, let it dry, don't use any fabric softener, softeners or anything like that and the idea is to keep it from uh, it, uh, having any scent at all that any of the animals can pick up on. So when you have to dry it, don't hang it in your garage because you have a lot of petroleum and cleaning products in your garage and the exhaust from your automobile. Um, don't hang it inside the house because of all the scents and smells uh, from cooking or cleaning in your house. And the best place to hang it is outside, uh, like on a deck, away from any, like a barbecue or anything like that, and just let it dry naturally. And uh, one, another thing to, to do is once you have your ghillie suit completed, is to have a special bag for it and your, and your hat and anything else. You just roll up your ghillie suit and you keep it in your bag once it's dry and then store it someplace nice and dry. Just don't, this isn't something you'd want to hang up in the closet. And also yet you can see by all the burlap and all the materials hanging, this is not the type of uh, clothing if you're hunting with, you don't want to hang next to a fireplace. This will go up in flames. Okay, what we're going to discuss now, uh, we have four ghillie suits uh, done by four different people and we're going to talk between the uh, subtle differences between the four uh, because there was a, ver a variety of techniques that were used on each of them to assemble them and we're going to basically critique and take a look and see what the pluses and minuses are of each of the suits. The first one we come up with here, <coughs> okay, looking at the front here you can see <coughs> this one hadn't had any pads yet. You still got a little bit of ways to go on the pads, okay, but so far if you'll flip it around for me, okay, done a pretty nice job on the back here okay so he's got nice shredded material and if you look in close here you can see he used the shoe goo technique to attach his netting he didn't sew his on there okay this by far is probably the quickest technique for attaching your netting to the ghillie suit and it's fairly solid okay once this stuff dries and set it's just as good uh, if not better than actual stitching and the nice thing about this is again it's quick and it does have a pretty firm bond on the material itself and again, there was no set pattern that he used here, okay? Got a lot of greens and browns, okay? This wouldn't be bad for a fall area. Probably uh, <clears throat> a little bit less on the green side for uh, this area up here. What I'm saying is he needs a little bit more green for this area around here, but it's not bad for a fall like a northeastern area uh, like that. And you can see with the shoe goo, another nice thing with these nice long strands, you can't really see where the seam on the side of the fabric is where he shoe goo because once this is laying like this and he's on the ground you're not going to be able to see it okay look at the next suit here okay you can see the uh, next suit <clears throat> we have our patches here on the chest and on the knees all right and again we use shoe goo on here the important thing to remember with shoe goo besides the uh, material that you're going to glue on the back here you also have to glue along the edge of the material itself now an important thing that he's done here, he rounded his corners off on, a, on his patches to make sure he didn't have any sharp edges to catch on underbrush and foliage as he's crawling along. And another important thing is after you get this glue along the seams, you want to go along and, and touch up areas that bowed out when it was drying 
so you don't have any open space underneath where stuff can get underneath and start tearing your patches away. So he added some additional shoe goo. Now obviously he's going to need to spray paint or hand paint whatever uh, his patches up front here to cover up this uh, somewhat glossy white finish on here. Okay, But did a good job gluing the patches on. Nice tough material right here, this canvas like we discussed earlier. Okay, And looking over on the back here, Again, see he's got a little bit of a, a lighter pattern, okay? Uh, <clears throat> almost uh, more along the lines, almost like a, a desert. But this ought to work pretty good. It's a little bit lighter uh, up here. And again, he's utilized the shoe goo technique, if we can get through some of this burlap here, to get down to some of the stitching. Okay, you can see here we've got the net. All right, and again, he utilized the shoe goo technique, but you can't even see the net through all the burlap that he has here. But again, pretty tough on there. It's not coming off anytime soon. All right, and again, all he'd use is an overhand knot here to attach his burlap, but he's got good coverage all the way around from the crotch all the way up to the neck region right here, because remember, your hat or your hood is going to cover this portion of the ghillie suit. It's also going to drape around the front of your shoulders, okay? So he's done a good job with this suit here. Okay, the next ghillie suit we have here, you see he's already camouflaged the front. All right, he used a little different material. He used the uh, rubberized nylon uh, for his material up front to reinforce his chest and in, in, uh, knee area here, okay? He's done a good job breaking up the colors here with various colors of paint. He used predominantly black and a light green and then shaded a little bit of the green with the uh, black, okay? And he's done a good job with his shoe goo, not too thick, but he's got all the edges covered up, all right? <coughs> and you see here, we might want to add just a little bit more paint right here. Okay, to cover this area up because it's still a little bit glossy right here. But overall, the front looks real good on this suit. Okay, we go ahead and turn it around here. Okay, again, <coughs> got a good job with the ghillie uh, or the burlap itself. And you see again, we use the uh, shoe goo technique to attach the netting right here. And again, once your stuff's laying down, you really can't see it. Another thing up here, you can see where the edge of the net is up here, but again, his headgear that he's going to be wearing on top is going to cover this up. But if you still feel kind of conscientious, you might put a little spray paint up here to cover up some of this white or tie additional burlap material on there. But overall, not a bad job on this suit. The last thing, obviously, we're going to have to do is cover up these elbows here a little bit too because we haven't had a chance to spray paint this one yet. Okay, go down to the last suit here. See, this one we used a, a little different technique on this one and the fact that uh, we sewed the canvas on this one instead of shoe gooing it. Uh, a little more time intensive, but uh, <clears throat> again, we uh, for this one I didn't have access to uh, dental floss, so we used a real heavy grade uh, nylon thread. Again, you want something like that that doesn't rot and has a very high tensile strength. But again, this one came out pretty nice uh, up front. There's no exposed edges along the seam right here, and it's pretty flush. And again, we spray painted to break up the color of the suit. And one thing to remember, with this one you can see it's almost kind of a, a whitish gray. That was originally black spray paint and the fabric absorbed a lot of the pigmentation from the paint. So you got this kind of off color gray instead of a true black. All right, something to bear in mind when you're spray painting clothes. Okay, you look along the back here, we did the same thing for the elbow pads. We spray painted those. Now this one's a little different in the fact that we sewed the material on instead of shoe gluing it, okay? Again, a more time intensive technique, okay? but it still gives the end result. I still got good solid contact on there and this pattern here <clears throat> with these nice uh, lime green it's pretty good for this area around here because you have a lot of moss okay so this isn't a bad uh, pattern right here and again if you look along the sides here you can see the seam where we've sewn the netting on here with the dental floss but again once the burlap's laying there you, you can't see it. An important thing to remember too on the edge of your ghillie suit I want to leave the last couple in uh, inches of your material blank right here for the simple reason you're going to be walking around and crawling okay and if you have overage on your burlap material it's going to get caught up on your feet okay and the last piece we'll show you with this one is our hat or headgear <clears throat> okay again we took an ordinary hat here and you can see the net that we have sewn on okay and what we did, we tied the burlap on here and then frayed it afterwards. You can see this one came out pretty good. All right? And obviously we got the overage here almost so you get that cape effect. So this hangs over your shoulders all right, to cover up any of the seams or areas you didn't get on your suit itself. 
Okay. One of the things to keep in mind when uh, using a flight suit as your ghillie suit, as the uh, base for your ghillie suit, is that these flight suits have a lot of pockets on them. And obviously with all the padding, the, uh, the burlap on the back, and the different types of materials that you have to add to this, you're not going to have the availability of one of the pockets. So one technique that we recommend is on the back of these flight suits there's a boot pocket, is what we call. And if you can, if you run your netting just above your boot pocket, and you leave your burlap hanging long enough, it'll give you enough to cover up the pocket, but you still have access to it. So when you're in the prone position, if you need something, you can just reach back, bend your leg up, and reach into your pocket and get it. So these are probably the only pockets you're going to have available on your ghillie suit, other than the one that's up on your left shoulder. And you can use this for film or bullets or whatever it is that you have to use. We're going to show you camouflage in two different pieces of equipment, the sniper rifle itself and a camera, depending on what your job is. We'll start off here with a rifle. We're going to go around the buttstock. All I've got is a cravat, or other people call them drive-on rags. I'm going to put this around the buttstock. Nothing fancy again, just going to get a wrap. And you don't want to try and have too much loose stuff because remember you're going to be going through underbrush so you don't want it too loose and flappy. And all we're going to do is secure it with a square knot. Then we come up here. Come around. Basically just kind of like you're uh, wrapping an ace bandage around a leg or an ankle, wrist, whatever. And a little of the burlap straps just so we don't have all solid green. You're just going to attach that on there as well. And you can see once again, we don't have anything that interferes with the action of the weapon. We can still operate our scope covers fine, front and rear. We've got nothing in front of the barrel, and we can also still operate our bipod as well. Okay, but we're just trying to break up the outline of the rifle itself, and also to cover up some of the exposed metal portions to stop any telltale glint that we might get from uh, the sun backlighting us or hitting us at certain angles. Okay, another piece of equipment, if you're an outdoor photographer, is a camera. Now cameras are kind of neat uh, in the fact that they're smaller and not as big as a rifle, so a lot of times you can just stuff them in uh, very similar to a drag bag. You just take a small laundry bag or even a dyed pillowcase and just drag that along with that. The important thing to remember though is if you have a large video unit, you're obviously going to have to use some type of drag bag because it's just too bulky and awkward and heavy to be trying to drag that just by the sling. But something small like this, we could even take a burlap sack like he has right here. And we could put it right inside of the sack and cover it up like that. Now obviously we'd want to dye this, but <clears throat> if we didn't have access to dye, we could very quickly cut some holes in this. Okay, what we're doing is just making a small incision on either side of the bag here and we're just going to take our camouflage netting
putting that through. And we're just going to twist the fabric up here a little bit so we've got a little easier material to work with. And we're just going to half hitch it or overhand knot the material off. So now you can see we repeat this process almost like we're doing a ghillie suit. But we tie several strips of this along the bag so as we're moving and dragging it, we don't just have a plain burlap bag. Just something to break up the uh, tan or khaki color of this in itself. things I'm doing, I'm just doing a final inspection of my headpiece and I noticed this green doesn't really fit in too well and I also kind of have a bare spot so what I'm going to do is cut the green out and I've already cut some strips of some different material that I want to add in and what I've done in the material here I just make a snip enough for, enough for this material to fit in. I'll go ahead and twist the end up so it's a little easier to work with. And I'll go ahead and insert it into the net. One thing to remember, your camouflage is never really done. And that's why you're always inspecting prior to actually starting your stock, your suit to make any uh, additions that you need to make. Or like I found, colors that really didn't fit in too well with the scheme. And now I'm just going to go ahead and fray this stuff. Just pulling out the strands from the side. Because of the foliage that we're going to be working in, I'm applying um, some different type of burlap to, uh, some different color burlap to my head headpiece so it'll uh, camouflage me better. And uh, I have to remember that I'm going to leave room on my headgear for the uh, surrounding natural foliage. One of the things we're doing, we just uh, went out to check a little bit how our pattern matched up and we noticed Ron's pattern was a little bit light. So what we're doing is taking the uh, atomizer or the spritzer bottle and we're, we've got dye in here and what we're doing is darkening up this pattern a little bit. Um, another technique you could use is using just a the, the, using a spray paint. Um, in this case, we have black and uh, green, leafy green. Go ahead and go around and hit some of the areas that you might have put too much brown on. And break up some of that color. There are a variety of camouflage paint products on the market, from the trays to the sticks. Any will do as long as they match your surroundings. The basic concept of face painting is to cover the prominent features of the face with the dark paint. The chin, mouth, nose, brow, and cheekbone will receive the darker colors. The deeper features of the face will receive the lighter colors, the cheek, the eyes, the forehead. And then follow the, nine, the lines on my neck to break up the pattern on my neck. And then down underneath the chin, my Adam's apple. All the way down to my throat. And even though the throat is not a high point on the face, you want to break it up. So what I'm doing is I'm applying, I'm going to do my throat in stripes. This will be a later a lighter green here and then once I apply the light green it's important to blend the colors in get it on nice and thick and then just take your finger and run it along where the colors join give it that blended look. 
thing that you want to do is when you're camouflaging your uh, face is not to forget your hands okay uh, as you can see it just stands right out um, what you can do is just go ahead and take your camouflage stick if you don't want to wear gloves is uh, just do uh, green and or light dark green and light green alternating or whatever just to break up the pattern of your hand um, the gloves is the most uh, preferred technique of using the camouflage your, your hands you know so one of the things these gloves that the guy is using is aviator gloves um, and you got your regular you got your regular uh, wool gloves and you have the you know uh, black leather gloves whichever uh, glove you want to use to cover your hands the other part of uh, your body that you want to camouflage is the back of your neck and head and also your ears and what you want to do is just uh, break up the pattern again using your dark green and your light green What I'm doing is, uh, because my gloves are a little bright, but uh, these are the gloves I prefer to wear in the field, just take a little of the soil, darken them up a little bit. My hands are not going to be seen while I'm stalking or crawling, but still, it, uh, it's not a bad practice to get into, just to dirty them up a little bit. You're going to be crawling around in the dirt and the mud and the sand or wherever, so uh, it's not really going to make that much of a difference. Before a stalk, Retouch your face and any other bare skin that may have lost paint during prepping activity. The front of the neck seems to be a spot that needs double checking. One of the things we're going to do to help aid the camouflage is going to add some natural vegetation to our raw suit here. So what we'll do take a look around the area we're going to be operating in and uh, try and get some of the vegetation at, at near or below level because he's not going to be up and walking around, he's going to be crawling. So we're going to take like some of the scotch brush and sawgrass that's around here and apply this to the back because that's the nice thing about this netting is that you can stick it right in there and almost weave it in. So we'll do take some of these pieces here and again you don't want 15 foot sections because it's going to be wiggling around like this. So you want fairly small pieces about like this. We're just going to weave it in and out of the material to help break up the outline and make the camouflage even more effective. One of the other things to keep in mind too, if you don't want to use the burlap, what you can do is just sew the net on the back and then when you get to an area, you can actually take foliage and stick it in the back. The important thing to remember though with the foliage it is going to die and brown on you after a few hours. So normal rule of thumb if you're going to use uh, natural vegetation you always try and get leafy uh, vegetation from uh, preferably a hardwood tree because that'll last the longest and then after that depending on what area of the country your furs or your needles would be uh, next. Grasses they'll start to brown within four to five hours. Thing we're going to talk about is the different movement techniques when you're actually on your belly. The first one's going to demonstrate for us is the high crawl. This is when you have to move somewhere rapidly but you still have a decent chance of getting detected by the enemy. <clears throat> you notice the profile is much higher and this might be initially where he's just changed into his ghillie suit and he's just coming into the area where he wants to stalk in to get his shot from. So he's got a better vantage point from here but he's still keeping a low silhouette. Again, this is the least preferred because it does present the largest silhouette. The next one would be the low crawl. He's finally starting to get close to his position now. So he's going to lower himself down. And you see what he's going to try and do is grab his weapon up by the sling or the bipod. He keeps it in tight to his body. Again, this is a more rapid movement technique than the sniper low crawl. What he'll do, he'll plant his right elbow forward and then push off with his opposite foot and move forward. Once he gets abreast and his rifle comes up, he'll recock his arm again, cock his foot and move forward. The last technique is the most preferred and the most time consuming. This is a sniper low crawl. Head down, weapon in tight along the body, 
and all he does is push off with his toes and his fingertips. It's a very slow, subtle movement. You're only going to move approximately four to six inches each time you move. And after every time you move, you stop, take a few breaths, and move on again. It's important when utilizing this movement technique to scan out your next position where you're eventually going to move to so you have some terrain feature or landmark to aim for as you're crawling along the ground because you don't want to keep poking your head up too much remembering that sudden movement attracts people's eyes. Camouflage while you're stalking is to heel your boot. And like Moan said earlier, when you're stalking, keep your heels down and your feet behind you. As you can see, especially with these boots here, if there's not any uh, grime or mud or dirt on them, they shine a little bit with the sunlight. And it definitely goes back. Although the, the ghillie suit itself kind of blocks out the view of the boots from the air, this is what will be seen. So a technique most common is just to take moss or dirt and mud, smear up the boots. Or what else is, uh, is used are gaiters. People actually make ghillie suits out of gaiters and they wear the gaiters. They put the gaiters on afterwards. And what's important to remember is if you're going to use gaiters, is that the, the uh, moulage on your gaiters is extremely short because it's going to be dragged a long ways and you don't want to leave a trail of your ghillie material behind you. So keep in mind that if you don't have any gaiters on and the best thing you have is to muddy up your boots, make them dirty, is always keep your heels down and your feet behind you. And if you know that an aircraft is coming, stop, try and rotate your boots into the brush or underneath some kind of brush. As you can see, from the air, guy would be very hard to spot from two or three hundred feet from a scouted helicopter or an airplane. A good technique is to take beeswax and coat your zipper up and down because of the different rain and uh, sometimes it may even get frozen solid and crawling through the dirt and muck will get it jammed up and that beeswax will help it stay free so you can unzip and get it back out of your ghillie suit when you need to. One of the things we've done here is we've taken some of the moss, this real thick moss bedding in here, and obviously we, we just took out a piece of the moss, section of the moss like a hunk of sod, and we applied it to the back of the ghillie suit. And this is really limits your working area, but for this, if he, if a guy was just gonna stay in this terrain, this would work well. The trick is, is to find a way to apply it, because if he stands up, it's gonna fall down. Even if he's crawling around, it's gonna roll back and forth. So one of the things you can do is, uh, Take some, uh, like even uh, coat hangers, make uh, U-shaped clips out of them, stick it through the sod, and then bend it up so the uh, edges are away from your body, and apply the sod, and then cover it back over. And you'd have to have your partner do this for you, or your spotter, and you'd do it for each other. And then cover the clip back up with the sod. And remember, I mean, you're not going to be able to run with this on, but just for a general stocking or uh, staying in one place, this will work quite well. As you can see, it's it uh, stays well with the body, and then when he has his hood on it'll blend in with the rest of the uh, ghillie suit. What we're going to do is construct what's called a Yeti. This is uh, a uh, natural ghillie suit, if you will, and very easy to make and pretty effective camouflage for that matter, too. And it's easy to put on and take off. The only thing, again, with the natural camouflage is the fact that <clears throat> it's going to die after a few hours. But for a short-term static position, or if you have to breach some type of wire obstacle, it's a uh, pretty effective technique. So what we've done, we've cut several bows down. Uh, Ramon, if you give me that roll of 550 cord, what we're going to do is we're going to trim this bow down a little bit. Now this doesn't have to necessarily be out of uh, pine or evergrow, evergreen bows. You can use uh, grass and things like that too, depending on what area you're going to be in. We're just using the evergreen just for the ease of uh, demonstration purposes and also to show that you can also use a ghillie type camouflage for standing up.
Here's what we've done. We've cut down a, a rather large bow, approximately five feet in length. And what we're going to do is going to take it, we're going to bend it like a snowshoe. Okay? Then we're going to secure ourselves about a two to three foot length of cordage. It can be 550 cord, it can be jute, whatever material you have at hand. Once we've got that piece, what we're going to do is lash this together almost like we get a snowshoe shaped uh, piece of material. First thing we'll do, I'm just going to use an end of the line bowline here. It doesn't matter what type of knot you use to affix it. I'm just using this one for right now. Okay, once I've got that secured on there, I'm going to bend this piece back around over the top. And all I'm going to do is secure it on here. Again, you can use whatever knot you want. doesn't make a difference. All I'm just doing is two round turns on that piece. And then coming across, then I'm going to make an, what they call an X wrap. Okay, just under, over, and then back over again. And then with the running end, back through the standing end, I'm just going to cinch it down like that, and one more time with a half hitch. Actually weave, uh, we can probably trim this one here a little bit too. She got rather smooth bow here. Okay, now what we're gonna do is weave the pieces in and out similar to a simple weave like you do for a basket. So we'll take our first piece, we're just going to go over the top and underneath. Second piece, we're going to go just opposite, over the top, underneath. We're going to keep repeating this process down the entire length until we've almost got like a ladder appearance. Going across here. So we get down here by the base. Okay. Once we're down by the base, okay. Now we're going to weave vertically back through the uh, <coughs> ladder we've just made, and just over, under, over, under the whole way up. So starting from the bottom, go under. Ron's going to help me out and hold this in place here. Over, under, the whole way up here. we get to the top. Okay, we take another piece. Now we're just going to switch and go from the top down. But again, same basic type weave over under the whole way down. And we'll get one more in there. And again, we're going to alternate, so we're going to start from the bottom again. Okay, one of the other things we're going to do to make sure that our weave stays in here pretty good, we're going to cut a couple small pieces and just tie the edges off to the actual frame itself to make sure that we don't lose any of our camouflage as we're going along. Important thing to note, if you're using 550 cord, make sure you put a half hitch or overhand knot on the end here. And that's to stop the material from fraying on you. And that's pretty good advice for any type of cordage or rope that you're going to use for anything really. When you tie this, make sure your knots are all at the bottom underneath your Yeti. Get on 
much, huh? Get one more on this side. You got one more short piece? Right here. Okay, the last thing we're going to do now is attach to some type of harness to attach this to your body. What we've done, we've measured out two pieces approximately three feet in length. And all you're going to do for this is go up about three quarters of the way up your uh, bow that you've made. And if I get one of the pieces of cord from on here, you're just going to secure it onto the back here. And one thing that you need to do is just take a bite like that, make an overhand knot like that so you have a little locking loop, okay? And then what we'll do, do a round turn, two half hitches. Because what this little loop does is it gives you something to tie it back off to once you're draping around your shoulders. Okay, we've got one side complete here. Now we're just going to repeat the process on the opposite side. Again, just taking a bite, passing it under and over. So we've got a little loop, pass that around, and we're just going to do again a round turn with two half hitches. Okay, once I'm satisfied with the knot, if I get one to come over because he's not camouflaged, I want to show you how dramatic this is. Okay, what you do is just have him turn around. And we're just going to hold this up against his back, pass one of the loops back through and crisscross in front of his chest so it stays on a little better. Okay, and then we take our other piece that we have on this side, which is right here. Okay, back over. Okay, and all you're going to do is take it back underneath his arms. You go up here to that pre-made loop that you have. Go ahead and cinch it down. Okay, any excess you can tuck behind or in front, doesn't really make a difference. Like I said, this is nice because <clears throat> it goes right on over the top of your gear and it's pretty good camouflage. We can get, uh, once Ron finishes up over there, we get Ron to go over and squat facing away from us down next to the uh, pine tree, or the fir tree rather. See how effective that is for a camouflage especially in the northwest area up here. But again, it doesn't have to be pine boughs. You can use grass, any other type of leafy vegetation. But the important thing to remember, again, is vegetation does die, and it will start to wilt on you after a period of time. Good? All right. Uh, the bush rag is another form of camouflage suit. Um, it's a bit different in that it's not designed to be used as a crawl um, suit, as the ghillie suit is. Um, with bush rag, it's more for doing a stock on your feet. So what it does is it covers your torso and it covers your head area and, of course, the back. So what you're going to do is you're going to get some of that same military netting and you're going to cut out a first chunk, which I've already cut out. You're going to cut out a piece that's uh, roughly six feet long and two feet wide. What you're going to be doing then is making into kind of a poncho. So you're going to cut out a little head area, and you don't want to overcut. You don't want to 
cut a hole that's too big so that when you put this on, uh, the material hangs low. You want it to come as close to your neck as possible, okay? And before I start tying in my burlap, I'm just going to throw it over my head, make sure I'm, I'm close. There we go. So I've got my basic dimensions, and I, I might want to tailor up a couple pieces that are hang too long. So once you cut out your, uh, your mesh, you're going to cut out a piece for your head. Now the head piece um, should roughly be about 18 inches by a foot, and that's going to be of course covering your head, and you're going to sew that into uh, a boonie cap, a PC, um, a watch cap, whatever you have. Um, once again, you're going to be tying in your burlap pieces. Um, this is stuff that we've already strung, and what we've kind of done is we've left a large portion of it undyed because we're going to be matching it to this desert grassland. So burlap, which hasn't been dyed, does have that nice natural color that blends well. Also, we've got a very light green with a lot of yellow in it that kind of looks like a dried grass, uh, maybe grass that's you know, halfway dead. Um, to get these lighter colors, you're going to get a regular clothing dye, and certain manufacturers write R-I-T-E dyes. And you'll probably want to get a yellow, a dark green, a lime green, and a brown, and also black, too, if, if you need it. Um, so you'll first want to do is, is read the directions to the dye, and you'll dye your dark greens first. Say you'll take your green dye, you'll make your batch, and you'll dye your darker cl colors. But then you're going to have some leftover water that still has some dye pigmentation. So what you can do to get, say, a lighter green to match maybe, see how this is too dark? You'll get your regular burlap. And in the same waters, this has still a little green tint. And what we did is we, after we d did the dark green stuff, we took the burlap and dunked it in. Um, just to give it a tint of a green. Here's another variation. This was we mixed some yellow dye with the, the dark green, just a tad of the dark green, to get more of a, a lime green. And so what you, what you might want to do is, is familiarize yourself with the area you're going to be stocking and bring in some clippings of the vegetation. And keep in mind that when you're going to be doing your stock that you're going to be at a certain level. You're going to be using vegetation like this when you're using the bush rag, this kind of crouching level. Whereas if you were doing a belly crawl stock, you'd probably use, in this area, if you can pan over, you see the little brighter greens, uh, more sand type colors. So this, this light green is looking pretty good. It might be a little too green for here. So when you do your ties, you might take a couple strands of your light green, get some of your undyed material, which you've stripped, and then kind of match it together. And when these are together, you know, it, it pretty closely hits upon uh, whatever sawgrass or brush that this is. So I'll take this. Once again, this is too long. I'm going to cut a proper length. And once again, scissors would probably be a little, a little more expedient. So I get my webbing back out. What you might want to do is you might want to get all, all your, your clippings all cut and ready so you can just sit down and just start tying in. So you're not getting up, cutting a piece, and coming back down. You just sit down, you've got your 100, 200 pieces of clipping, and you just start tying in. This is a bit too thick. I like to get about little 20 strand pieces. And if you notice, if you have any tears, like right down here, you've kind of got a little tear in, in the webbing. And since it's surplus, you're buying it used, this is an opportune time to actually use your burlap ties and do a little repair work. And if you, for instance, say, cut uh, the aperture for your head a little too large, you might want to just cinch it down with a couple of the ties. So that said, we should talk about the actual burlap material. Burlap is ideal for uh, these camouflage suits because it's a thick fiber, 
that takes dye rather easily. Um, but it also has a rigidity to it. So what it will do is it will stand out, it will fluff out more, breaking up the human form, creating a more moundish, rounded off shape than the angular lines of a human body. So cotton, which is another type of fiber that someone might use, it's a bit, it's, it's a finer, um, it's a finer, smaller fiber, so it doesn't have as much rigidity and it'll lay flatter. So you might want to keep away from cottons unless you're allergic to burlap. Some people do have hay fever or grass allergies and this might um, aggravate them. So um, if you do have allergies, you might want to stick with a fiber that you're not um, allergic to, but if not, you want to stick with the burlap. And once again, this is all burlap pieces that we have uh, stripped from burlap bags and we've gone over that. Um, a little hint with stripping burlap bags is that you want to strip them when they're dry and maybe even before you dye them. So you'll probably you'll strip all the strings out of the burlap bags, um, get some nice bundles, and you'll dye the bundles rather than dyeing the bags first. Here's one that we've just started, is that you're going to tie your darker burlap pieces into or onto the side, the darker side of the webbing. This military webbing as you can see, it has a lighter side and it has a darker side. So tie the darker pieces into the darker side and also you're going to be tying in lighter pieces onto the light side. So therefore you have a reversible uh, camouflage suit. You can wear the lighter side and let me see, I think we have one already made up. Here's a full bush rag. Now this is the body section. Here you have your lighter side which would work well with you know, these grasses and the desert tones. And then you have a darker side for uh, more of your um, forest looks. Another thing about the bush rag is that you can actually push through material from the other side. So you could be in a certain area, say a chaparral, which isn't completely light, isn't completely dark, and you can kind of mix and match. You might start with your lighter side and then push through your greens and some of your browns. So therefore you have a product or a camouflage system that's very versatile. So we've pretty much completed this bush rag. Uh, to put it on, you just uh, slap it over. And since you've got your poncho, you're going to need a belt to cinch around your waist. Uh, here's just a regular webbing belt. What you want to do is buy the lighter type and dye one side a darker green. So therefore you have a type of a reversible belt. Of course, this silver uh, gold buckle is going to have to go. Um, web belts come with a black uh, metal. If not, you can just spray paint this, but I'm going to use this for now. So, cinch down on this. And when you put your webbing, sorry, your web belt in, make sure you take some of your ties and make sure that they drape over so you don't have just a belt sticking out. For the headpiece, now this is a smaller portion of webbing, as we said, 18 inches to a foot wide, and we've tied in all the burlap. You want to tie it into your hat, and what we've done is we've actually taken the burlap strips and tied it into the loopholes that we have around the hat. Uh, if you're tying into a, a patrol cap or if you're tying into a watch cap, you're going to have to probably cut little holes to tie in this material. So you've tied on your bush rag. Uh, also, when you buy your hat, you should buy it a size large because when you tie in your bush rag, it kind of cinches down on the fabric and, and uh, downsizes it by usually a size. So if you're a size seven and a quarter, you might want to get seven and a half. There we go. As you can see, the hat element kind of does a cape action comes down and hides the neck area. Um, gonna adjust it while it's on and you want some, piece, some pieces to fall in front of your face because that kind of hides the darker areas as you see. Um, though if it starts to impair your vision too much you might want to trim off the areas so you've got a nice field of vision. And that there is your bush rag. As you can see it has a real nice moundy appearance, breaks up the upper body and it's good for a person doing a stock when he isn't actually using his belly to to motor.
So if the person is doing a crouch type stock, bush rag might be the way to go. And you probably want to work more of your upper body, your shoulders, your head, uh, the parts of your body which will be most easily seen when you're doing your when you're doing your stock. One thing you have to keep in mind about um, making a ghillie suit is that the only way you're going to get a good ghillie suit that will really work is to put the time and effort into making your own. And you'll find that once you spend a lot of time making your own ghillie suit, all the effort and the labor that you put into it, that uh, it's, it says something about you personally. You can see all the ghillie suits that we have here are all, they all have different colors, different tones, and different styles and techniques. There are ghillie suits you can go out and buy, but they're factory made and they're really not all that effective. It's, it's, a, it's a marketing scheme and it's a lazy man's way to make a ghillie suit. You find that when you make your own ghillie suit and people ask you to borrow it, just say no. Because uh, there's no way that once you put all the le effort and labor into making your own ghillie suit, you're going to loan it out to somebody else. It's your ghillie suit. Take care of it and uh, maintain it well.